Bill Moss, and I'm the Executive Director of the International Vaccine Access Center. And it's my great pleasure to welcome to you, welcome you to today's seminar. The International Vaccine Access Center is a center within the Department of International Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And our mission is to accelerate global access to life-saving vaccines through development and implementation of evidence-based policies. We've hosted a number of webinars on vaccines and, and particularly during this COVID-19 pandemic. And today's topic couldn't be more timely. As many of you know, the World Health Organization identified vaccine hesitancy as one of the 10 greatest global health threats in 2019. And the issue of vaccine he hesitancy has only grown more important as the world begins to roll out COVID-19 vaccines. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the two speakers for today's seminar, um, Dr. Caitlin Christensen, uh, who is Vice President for Vaccine Acceptance and Demand at the Sabin Vaccine Institute, and Dr. Rapali LeMay, who's a faculty member here in the Department of International Health and Director of Behavioral and Implementation Science at the International Vaccine Access Center. Caitlin, I'm gonna turn it over to you to begin the, the seminar. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, and, and thanks to all of you for joining us for what we hope will be an interesting discussion and dialogue today. And as Andrew said, we hope you'll send in your questions and we hope you'll use the chat feature, not just to share questions, but also to engage with each other. We're most interested to hear those questions, but we also welcome your input and your feedback on what we're sharing today. As Bill said, my name is Caitlin Christensen and I oversee the Vaccine Acceptance and Demand Initiative at the Sabin Vaccine Institute. So for those who aren't familiar with Sabin, Sabin is a leading advocate for expanding, expanding vaccine access and uptake globally, for advancing vaccine research and development, and for amplifying vaccine knowledge and innovation. As part of that mission, the Vaccine Acceptance and Demand Initiative is working to understand the various factors that can affect vaccine acceptance, and then to invest in interventions that can help strengthen that acceptance. We do this through a program of social and behavioral research by investing in projects led by research teams within low and middle income countries, by convening interdisciplinary experts to exchange knowledge about vaccine acceptance, and by working with journalists and health workers who often serve as important gatekeepers of health information to strengthen their capacity to communicate about vaccines and immunization. And as part of this, we're examining the power of social media to affect vaccine decisions. Andrew, let's move to our next slide and dive in. So as, as many of you know, um, a recent increase in vaccine preventable disease outbreaks has caused many of us to examine what factors may be driving these outbreaks. Vaccine hesitancy has been proven to be an important factor alongside other issues, contributing to this resurgence of diseases like measles that had all but been eliminated in many settings. Before we dive into our discussion, focusing more on social media interventions, we wanted to share a bit of context about how we think about the issue of vaccine hesitancy. So as you see here, we're defining vaccine hesitancy as a delay, in the, a delay in the acceptance or the refusal of vaccines despite those vaccines being available. Now, it should be noted that vaccine hesitancy and vaccine acceptance are not static states, but that people move along a continuum of hesitancy, hesitancy and acceptance. And where an individual may be hesitant for one vaccine, they may choose to accept another. Vaccine hesitancy is affected by a number of overarching factors, often spoken about as the three C's. So that includes complacency or not perceiving a need for vaccines or a risk, convenience or limited access to vaccines, and confidence, both in the vaccine itself, the product, as well as in healthcare providers or the broader health system that's providing that vaccine. Vaccine hesitancy is often perpetuated online, particularly via social media channels, 
where misinformation, where any kind of misinformation, but particularly misinformation can spread rapidly and often goes unchecked. Next slide, Andrew. The potential for information to spread on social media, spread via social media to influence is significant. And we know that individuals will use social media to seek information about health issues and to inform their decision making, including decisions about vaccines. Social media platforms have served as an important mechanism for health professionals to share information with clients and with the broader public. And we've really seen the power of this during the COVID-19 pandemic with not only health professionals, but also major health agencies like the US CDC, the World Health Organization, disseminating lots of information about COVID-19, about COVID-19 vaccines on social media. But social media also offers users not just access to information, but also the opportunity to engage with peers, to seek support from others who may have the same kinds of questions. All of that said, there is still a great deal that we don't know about the impact of social media to influence vaccination related knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors. Next slide. Andrew, let's go to our next slide, please. Oh, sorry, delay on my end. So it's against this context that Sabin and IVAC decided to collaborate. We believe that there's more that can be done to further harness online platforms to strengthen vaccine acceptance. And so our collaboration sought to look at this through a, a research lens and to explore published literature that would tell us more about which social media interventions have had an impact on vaccine hesitancy and then to cross check that literature review with interviews with key informants from a variety of backgrounds. We wanted to use this information to learn more about the, exact, the gaps in existing scholarship to develop a research agenda. And our goal is to share that research agenda with a broader global health, immunization, social and behavioral science communities, as well as with social media platforms to ignite a discussion and ultimately support the generation of more knowledge on this issue. So with that introduction, I'll now turn it to my colleague Rupali, who along with the team at IVAC led this effort um, to talk a bit more about the methodology and the results from that work. Rupali? Thanks so much, Caitlin. And it's great to be here. Um, great to meet you all. I'm glad you all are introducing yourself in the chat as well. Please be sure to use the Q&A function and we'll try to get to that during our presentations as well. So as Caitlin mentioned, what we really wanted to do collaboratively with Sabin and Caitlin's team over at Sabin was really try to figure out what has been done, what interventions have been tested to really reduce vaccine hesitancy and what have evidence. So what did we do? We followed a number of steps we first established a review protocol that included inclusion as well as exclusion criteria. We then conducted our search where we worked with an informationist to identify potential databases. We then screened articles by title and abstract and then to a secondary step of full text. We then extracted key information from these different articles. And then after this was done, we conducted key informant interviews to make sure any gaps that we found through this systematic literature review, we could ask through key informants. So if we can go to the next slide. So first we had a little bit, almost 12,000 records were identified when we started with our database searching. You can see there was a number of duplicates that we then removed. Um, our team screened approximately 11,600 um, titles and abstracts for eligibility, which led us to about 415 articles that were full text. And then we essentially at the very end came up with 63 studies that had evaluated in some way, shape or form interventions to reduce vaccine hesitancy. So if we can go to the next slide. Great. So what we wanted to do, we really cast our, our, our net wide. We wanted to make sure that we were including interventions through all countries. So included studies were conducted globally or, or in one of 15 countries is what we found in the 63 that we retained for inclusion. So there were very, very few studies that had been conducted in lower middle income countries, which we're going to talk to when we get to gaps. Next slide. 
So in terms of study design, we wanted to break these down with regards to what were the different study designs in our included 63 studies. So the majority of these were observational in nature. So about 40% were observational studies. We had about a fourth of them that were randomized control trials. We had about 19% that were calling other study designs. These tended to be things like program evaluations, um, more of process evaluations, if you will, and then about 18% that really focused on sentiment analysis in these, in these studies. So if we go to the next section. So the way that we categorize this, as Caitlin mentioned, you know, the way that behaviors are formed related to vaccines, as many of you know, is that there's a lot of influences as to why individuals would decide whether or not to accept a vaccine. One way that we can think about this is through a socio-ecological lens, which is the figure here on the right, with the argument that there are factors at each of these different levels that influence individuals as to whether or not they should accept a vaccine. So for example, at the individual level, those are individual knowledge, attitudes, and skills. At the interpersonal level, what we have found is that social networks and peer norms are very critical with regards to vaccine uptake. At the institutional level, we know that environmental um, issues, including ethos, are important. And then, of course, at the community level, where there are community level norms, and then policy level, there's also policies that influence individuals. And so what we decided to do in our review is to really organize these findings by socio-ecological influence. And we did this by really breaking it up into three key domains. So vaccine interventions that focused on improving knowledge, those that focused on improving attitudes, and those that actually focused on improving vaccine behaviors. And that's how I'm gonna talk about the results. So if we can go to the next slide. So from the knowledge perspective, one sort of key aspect that we really pulled from this work is that First of all, prior to this work and prior to COVID, it's been very clear that individuals, more individuals are turning to social media for vaccine information. The interesting point I can add here is that the more uncertain you are, the more likely you are to turn to social media for vaccine information. And so as a result, social media platforms have this really robust and tremendous potential to improve vaccine knowledge, to nudge people towards vaccine acceptance. With that being said, one thing that we did learn from these studies is that disseminating vaccine knowledge through these platforms, whether it was Twitter or Facebook or WhatsApp or YouTube, but it's really an excellent way to engage with the community and also identify vaccine knowledge gaps. So this was really critical when we were looking at some of the organizations, for example, from a public health department perspective or um, a health department perspective or a physician's office, for example, how they could really improve knowledge among their patients using social media. So one thing that was very key is that social media platforms also play a key role in mitigating vaccine misperceptions, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail on a subsequent slide. You can go to the next slide. Great. So there were a number of studies that really looked at vaccine hesitancy interventions that sought to really change attitudes and get people to be more positive towards vaccines and reduce their hesitancy. One thing that we felt was very interesting in our search was that looking at vaccine attitudes through social media platforms can very much help and inform interventions. And what I mean by that, it can really assist in coming up with audience segmentation. So understanding what are the different segments of the audience so that subsequently you can essentially develop a tailored intervention to really target the attitudes that people have to move them towards vaccine acceptance. The other thing that we found is that while prior attitudes are very, very strong predictors with regards to how people will engage um, to a specific post, one thing that has changed with regards to social media is this idea of social media influencers. So before, in the past, we might have individuals that were very strongly rooted in an attitudes about vaccines. And because they'd had that attitude for a long time, found that it was difficult to move them one way or the other. Well, with the advent of social media influencers as well as TikTok coming on, this has been a little bit of a changing landscape. And what we have found is that social media influencers can sway attitudes. So before when we thought these attitudes might be immovable, they can be immovable. And as attitudes about immunization are polarized, meaning people are either super pro vaccine or are negative vaccine, we do know that certain influencers and what we found such as media organizations as well as celebrity doctors, for example, are really critical. And so the key takeaway here is to try to determine within these networks that people live in, these social networks that people live in, can we identify key influencers and can we equip them 
with pro-vaccine type of communication so that they can continue to influence social networks in this way. The other piece that we found is that there was a number of studies that had in-person interventions where they worked one-on-one -on -one with people, where they had trainings, where they used a peer educator response. And they actually found that if you include that in-person intervention and you add on a social media piece, it can really change vaccine attitudes. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that one is sort of one-on-one -on -one in person, whereas social media, you're a little bit more removed. And I think people might feel more comfortable with engaging in discussions that might be what I would consider sensitive. And unfortunately, because of the way that vaccine attitudes are sort of trending, not only here in the United States, but overall, vaccines have become a little bit more of a hot debate type of a topic. So this has been really critical to think about how you could supplement at things that you would do in person with social media types of interventions. The other piece that was key with regards to attitudes is that framing is really important. And I think people are, are likely familiar with this, but this idea of how do you frame a vaccine? So there's something called gain versus loss. And this means that essentially I could include a message that I could post on social media that would say, if you get a vaccine, this is what you will gain versus if you get a vaccine, this is what you will lose. So there's been a lot of work that's looked at framing and there's been a lot more work that has been recently undertaken simply because of everything that's happening with COVID and some of the vaccine hesitancy issues we're particularly dealing with not only in the States, but globally. The other piece that is fascinating, and this has continued to become, I think, an issue when you talk to computer scientists as well that have been studying network simulations, is that vaccine attitudes are clustered. So similarly, in the same way that you might only hang out with people, for example, that have similar political affiliations and attitudes that you do, it's very similar when you look at social networks online. You're finding that most people are creating something called an echo chamber, meaning that when you're talking about a vaccine on social media, you're likely going to be talking to other people that are like-minded as you. The problem with that is that this becomes a real challenge because innovation, it's much harder to have innovation occur within these networks because you're not getting different views and different perspectives. And so it's really important to think about how can we use network focused interventions? So whether that's identifying a key influencer and really educating them as a peer educator or other interventions would be very important to consider and to think about moving forward. If we can go to the next slide, Andrew. Thank you. So there were fewer studies that really used and, and evaluated interventions and whether or not based on those interventions, whether people actually change their behaviors. One thing that we found is doing the social network analysis approach as well as web searches. These, these types of items and types of interventions may serve as a proxy measure for vaccine hesitancy. So for example, when you go to Google and you're typing in you know, what are issues related to vaccines? That can help us really depict and understand sort of from a location perspective where there might be issues related to vaccine behavior where people might be hesitant. The other piece that I would say is there were several interventions that focused on tailoring interventions and essentially tailored interventions to different audiences based on their concerns. And they found that those did have some promise with regards to actually changing vaccine behavior to move people towards accepting a vaccine. And then the last thing I would say is this whole issue of comments. There was a number of studies that looked at if someone posts something, let's say an influencer posts something related to a vaccine, and then you look at the number of comments and you look at how many are positive and how many are negative, it's really important for vaccine acceptance. And again, to me, this is also very much related to the social network perspective, because if you're living in an echo chamber where people are agreeing with everything that you're saying, it's gonna be really hard to sway attitudes. And so the argument is, how do we invite people to intermingle, if you will, between social networks that might not usually intermingle between social networks so that we can continue to leverage influencers in key networks? We can go to the next slide. Great. So as Caitlin mentioned, so this was just a very, I think, top sort of um, very brief summary of what we found in the interventions. And we're hoping that our paper is, our systematic review is under review. And we're hoping once that is out, we will be sure to share that. But what we did after we did this, this systematic review is that we also spoke with about 20 different key informants that work in social media and vaccines. So these were individuals from NGOs. These were individuals for government. 
these were individuals from social media companies, to try to get a sense from them, what had they learned? What do they know about interventions that could reduce vaccine hesitancy that were using social media? So we found out a couple of things. So first, we found out that social media has the potential to better focus the message and really fill in some crucial gaps. And this is a key issue here that I wanna highlight, particularly in relation to COVID. COVID has been such a dynamic environment for us. And I think many of you know that work in public health, it's been really hard to keep up. And so what many in informants told us is that social media sort of fills that crucial gap, that they might be getting some information from the news, they're getting some information from their peers, but social media kind of ends up figuring out what else. If I have a question about X, I'm gonna to go to social media. The other piece that I would say is that social media campaigns could influence vaccination intent or receipt, particularly if the source, i.e. the messenger, is credible and people engage in positive discussion about the vaccine. And again, I would highlight that this has become, I think, more and more important as we're dealing with COVID and a number of public health agencies and what I would consider individuals from the healthcare system might have been undermined and might have less credibility than they did before, it's really crucial to figure out ways in which we can identify these messengers. And these are information sources that are not only credible, but that they're also engaged with. The other piece that I would say is that there's a whole, there's a whole number of articles that focused on sentiment. So understanding whether people were positively have attitudes towards vaccines or negative attitudes and to try to categorize those sentiments slightly further. One thing I would say is that this type of analysis is very critical for us to consider to look at to understand how messages spread, particularly in the context of misinformation. And we can talk about that more. There's been a number of studies that have looked at how messages go viral. What are sort of the elements that they have? What are the attributes that they may have? And a lot of that has to do with this idea of clustering. So if we can go to the next slide, Andrew. Great. The other thing that we found, again, in relation to our key informants, is that there really is a lack of monitoring and surveillance of social media. All the individuals that we spoke with felt as though that it was really hard for them to get a grasp of what was going on, what type of misinformation was going on, and how to address that misinformation. And key informants also told us that there should be stronger and stricter policies from the industry and government side to take a more active role. Now, I don't know if you all have seen the news, but Facebook, I think just yesterday, announced essentially that they were going to flag and remove all vaccine misinformation on Facebook, which was a huge step forward for them. I know Twitter has done similar types of policies in changing what kind of misinformation they do allow on their platform and their site, but this is still sort of new, if you will. And as we continue to see more misinformation, how do we continue to engage with government as well as industry folks to make sure that they're also on top of this to make sure that they're mitigating this information? The other piece that I would say is that it's there's also a limited ability with most folks that we spoke with, with regards to how social media campaigns are working to reduce vaccine hesitancy. So there just aren't metrics, for example. And then again, sort of what I had spoken about earlier, that future research should really focus on how do we leverage influencers? And then how do we test some of these appeals that maybe worked in the past in terms of nudging people towards accepting other healthy behaviors, but may not be working with regards to the COVID-19 context. So if we can go over to the next slide, I'm gonna turn it back over to Caitlin to talk us through some of the gaps. Thanks for that, Rupali. So <clears throat> I think um, Rupali just outlined some of the findings and now I'll speak a bit more about some of the, than the gaps. And there were some important gaps that were revealed through the team systematic review in particular. And I think first, and and critically, there are very few studies that examine these issues within the context of low and middle income countries. And in fact, there were no studies included in our review from any low income settings. So we know that access to social media platforms may vary, and but we also know that there's been a rapid increase in the use of social media in low and middle income settings. And that individuals in those settings often rely on platforms like WhatsApp for communication. So, Strengthening our understanding of the effectiveness of social media interventions on vaccine hesitancy in these settings will be critical as we seek to develop more interventions, and particularly as we seek to roll out a, a new vaccine globally. We also noted that many of the studies examined interventions with college age populations, and so some limitation there. 
and, and a need for more information to understand the impact of these interventions across a broader range of ages and a broader set of uh, populations. Studies also often focused on examining interventions around vaccines that work against specific antigens. And few studies explored vaccine hesitancy or acceptance more broadly. So we, we saw that flu, pertussis, HPV, and measles were among those that are most commonly studied. And then additionally, there is a lack of studies using a randomized control trial design. So as Rupali mentioned earlier, about 25% of the studies um, that were included here, which limits their ability to understand and then quantify the effectiveness of social media interventions. And lastly, few studies were included in the review that explored networks. We probably spoke earlier about the importance of networks uh, and the dynamics of networks, and, and we know that decisions often cluster within those networks. Um, and, and so we had few, a lack of research that helped us really understand and quantify vaccine influencers in the context of, of networks. Next slide, please. So then as we step back, um, looking at those findings and those gaps and start to examine the results of the systematic review and, and those interviews with key informants, there are a number of different emerging themes and takeaways. And I think first it's, it's important to note that research in this space is relatively nascent. Um, in our review of literature, the team found that most studies have been, were conducted after 2010, and that every year more studies were published than the year prior. And even, of course, since the conclusion of this, of this effort of the systematic review, research is continuing to proliferate. As I mentioned a moment ago, there is an important gap in understanding the effectiveness of social media interventions on vaccine hesitancy within low and middle income countries. And, and that needs to be an important research priority moving forward. The internet and social media platforms, you know, as, as we've been noted, as we, we all know, have become primary sources of health information, including about vaccines. Research is telling us that individuals are generally willing to obtain vaccine information on or from social media platforms. So health professionals, should continue to see social media as an important mechanism for sharing accurate factual information to support vaccination decisions. The attributes of messaging are crucial to influencing vaccine behavior, but there continues to be a need for more research to examine which attributes are most or more persuasive to individuals at different points along that continuum of vaccine behavior to help professionals better tailor messages to strengthen vaccine acceptance. And, and as we said, there are clear trends of clustering in online social networks around vaccine um, decision-making processes and the polarization between those networks around vaccine attitudes is growing. So we need to do more to identify and equip key opinion leaders, but we also need to better understand as Rupali was, was noting, which individuals are trusted within online networks, which individuals are best positioned to, to serve as or are serving as influencers to help us understand how then health professionals or others can effectively use their own voices and their platforms to influence vaccine acceptance. The rapid rise and spread of misinformation on social media is an urgent priority and there is a need to further examine and test innovative approaches to mitigate the impact of vaccine misinformation. Research and interventions in the space are rapidly evolving, particularly in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and the COVID-19 infodemic. Um, next slide, please. So thinking about COVID specifically and the implications of these findings around COVID-19, the, the pandemic and the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines have created much more urgency to understand this link between social media, social media interventions and vaccine hesitancy or acceptance, given this vast spread of misinformation via social media, but also considering the, the very narrow window of time we have to strengthen vaccine acceptance as a vaccine is, is being rolled out. When we consider the implications of COVID-19 on our review, there are a few key additional factors that I would highlight. Um, 
first is this heavy politicization of vaccination for COVID-19, along with other preventative measures. And the pandemic is also having important impacts on access to and then motivation around seeking routine immunization. More testing of messages is important for us to be able to understand which content has strong appeal within which audience segments. Um, there, there continues to be work around this um, and, and we're learning more in a really rapid pace around COVID-19. But we need to keep in mind that vaccine hesitancy and vaccine acceptance do occur along that continuum as we think about the targeting of messaging and the effectiveness of messaging. Of course, as more vaccines are introduced with different characteristics, um, the challenge of messaging about those vaccines and, and about the complexities of those different characteristics um, and how those vaccines will be used continues to grow. And lastly, this urgency around addressing COVID-19 misinformation means that innovations and interventions are continuing to be trialed in a rapid pace. And it's really critical that as those interventions are rolled out, they include strong evaluation components so that we can better understand their effectiveness and, um, and, and tweak them or scale them up depending on what we're learning. So next slide, please. So considering these findings, we have developed a research agenda to highlight the most urgent areas that we see for future research examining the impact of social media interventions. And um, here's where we want to solicit your thoughts as well. We're, we're curious to hear your reactions to these five questions that we've laid out. And I think my colleague will be pulling up a poll to solicit your input. And so as, as you're reading through, I'll, I'll walk you through these, these five research questions. Um, and we wanna understand from you, which area would you prioritize as needing the most attention? So the first question here is, what strategies could be used to improve vaccine acceptance generally? Second, what strategies could be used to improve COVID-19 vaccine acceptance? Third, what strategies could help users recognize and reject vaccine misinformation? Fourth, how can we better understand vaccine sentiment? And last, fifth and last, what specific tools can be used for measuring vaccine hesitancy? So as we're waiting for you to, to add your responses to respond to the poll, I'll just note that we hope to continue to explore this research agenda with a variety of different stakeholders and to determine how a global set of actors can work together to carry out. And we'll speak about that in, in just a moment about how we aim to implement this and move this forward. So Andrew, whenever you're ready, let us know when we have our results here. Okay, so I think we're seeing a lot of prioritization among these first three, but um, this, the issue of strategies to help recognize and reject vaccine misinformation is taking that slight lead. Um, so thanks to all of you for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, really helpful for us as we continue this work. And Rupali, with that, I will pass it back over to you to talk a bit more about our framework for implementation. Thanks so much, Caitlin, and thanks to you all who took the poll. You know, I think there was a number of, to be honest, after doing this review, I think, first of all, we were a little bit surprised that there weren't more studies that have really rigorously, at least in the peer-reviewed literature, I will say that, that have published um, on this. And I think it's important for us to figure out how do we prioritize moving forward. And with that being said, um, we pulled together an implementation research framework, and I'm just going to go through this relatively quickly because so we'd really like to get to your questions. I know there's quite a few of them. Um, really to think about moving this forward. And again, our focus here was trying to understand, are there social media interventions that we can test in lower and middle income countries that have some evidence? You know, as especially I think communications officers in those countries are really struggling, for example, with misinformation and sort of negative attitudes towards vaccines. And so we pulled together um, this implementation research framework. We're essentially coming up with sort of four key steps with regards to how to move this work forward. So first the problem 
problem was reviewing the literature. Um, again, then identifying partners. So figuring out who all is working in this space so that we can think about how to identify potential funding streams to continue to move this work forward globally. Um, consultation, again, to engage a range of partners and stakeholders to gather their input, define the roles and responsibilities, and really come up with this consensus, like this poll that you all just filled out with regards to what should prioritization look like? But then finally, really application. And so if you can go to the next slide, Andrew, I think this is close to the end of our, our slides that we have. Um, in terms of defining the problem, as, as Caitlin mentioned, these were sort of the key research questions that bubbled to the top for us after undertaking this systematic review, as well as doing key informant interviews with about 20 individuals. Um, these seem to be doubling at the top. And then what we're seeing from you all is maybe the top three would be even be prioritized a bit further as sort of the top top, if you will. And then if we go to the next slide, Andrew, the next slide would be really thinking about who are the different partners um, in this space? And how can we make sure that we're engaging with those different types of partners? So one question I know that's coming up in the chat and I can go ahead and answer that now, the majority of our key informants were from lower and middle income countries. And we did that on purpose. That was because one, we didn't have a lot of studies that were focused on lower and middle income countries. And we wanted to make sure that we were able to talk to social media strategists as well as communication individuals, as well as folks from industry from these different countries so we could get a sense of what was happening. The other piece that we were finding here is that once we started to map the partners and identify the strengths, we realized that there's a lot of different folks that are, that are involved in this space, right? That might be looking at hesitancy through a different lens, but really important that if we really wanna focus on social media and leverage the power of social media to nudge people towards acceptance, how do we make sure that all of these different groups are at the table? And again, this is a start for us. Um, I don't, I think Caitlin measured, uh, mentioned this as well. When we pulled this together, this is something we'd like to continue to pursue because we think it's important to have consensus and move this forward in a very, I would call it much more um, participatory way with a number of partners. So this includes not only partners, as you can see here from the policy and implementation lens, but partners that sort of give cross-cutting support. So some of these larger partners that work in vaccine and immunization generally, but also thinking about funding and financing. You know, we heard a lot from our key informants that they felt as though they're dealing with misinformation on social media, but don't really have any budgets or resources to figure out how to mitigate that misinformation so that people in their countries are getting access to accurate information. And then of course, this last sort of piece is thinking about partners that might be more involved in research and training. So again, pulling on universities, but also looking at independent experts and training networks. So all together in terms of mapping this, this is going to need to include a, you know, a massive effort that includes partners from all of these four spheres, if you will, working together to really agree upon how do we move this forward so that we can continue to think about ways in which we can leverage social media. So if we go to the next slide, I think in terms of, of step three, so after identifying the partners, it's really important to, to build some consensus and prioritize moving forward. And there's a couple of things that we have listed here, again, based off of what we have read and the individuals that we have spoken with doing and undertaking this work. But again, thinking about the different aspects that we need to all be moving toward if we wanna to continue to make innovation, I would say, in this space and try to figure out ways in which we can continue to use social media for vaccine acceptance. So a couple of things that we have written here, for example, is how do we train how frontline workers on key questions about vaccines, right? So if, if they are essentially asked about misinformation, how do you manage that? Um, from a cross-cutting support perspective, you know, is there sort of this idea of integration, is it important to incorporate a targeted social media component in Gabby applications and communications plans, right? So again, this is just sort of what we came up with. Again, I think it's up for discussion. We want to get feedback from this. This is important for us to continue to revise this. And then of course, as I mentioned on the last slide, thinking about how to fund all of this. What we did learn also through our key informants is that social media is sort of usually an add-on for most people. So it's sort of incorporated with someone else that's working on behavioral interventions in general, for example. So how do we make sure that this type of work is financed if we want to continue to, to work in this space? And then of course, from a research and training perspective, you know, the lack of really RCTs that can really, I think, clearly show us these are approaches that work that we should try and apply in different contexts. 
that's a huge gap that what we have found from this work, but also thinking about how do we support early career and next generation researchers in low and middle income countries so they can continue to move this work forward and build some capacity at the country level is also critical. So if we go to the next slide. This is just um, the last step in this type of implementation framework, which is implementation and evaluate. And we have used the re-aim. I think many of you are probably familiar with this type of a strategy. It's just a step-by-step -step approach of how you would really look at how do you translate research into action. And so I think with that, if we go to the next slide, Andrew. Great. I just want to say very quickly, um, you know, this has been a collaborative effort. And one thing I will say, and I know Caitlin mentioned, this work is very much unfinished. This was the first step of trying to gain a sense of what was happening in landscape, what the literature shows us, what key informant interviews can tell us about what's going on, but continuing to move this forward so that collaboratively we can work together to use social media to reduce hesitancy. I do want to just acknowledge the teams that were involved with this. I want to thank Caitlin Christensen as well as her team over at Sabin that were fantastic collaborators in all of this work. And then there was a number of folks at IVAC that were involved as well that I just wanted to acknowledge. So that is it in terms of our slides. I think it's probably we can go over to the Q&A. Um, great. I know there's a number of questions here. So maybe I can just sort of start, Caitlin, and then we can we can try to. Yeah. I think our and I think our first question is um, an interesting one about the our, our view on the WHO social listening service and um, and and maybe for those who aren't familiar um, the the link was in included here um, and this is essentially a social listening tool that that is um, being piloted with twenty countries to show real-time information about how people are talking about COVID-19 online. And I would just say that, um, you know, developing a better understanding of what the conversation is online will help us consider interventions, including what type of factual information is important to relay. And so the, this tool helps identify what some of that online conversation is. It's looking at it, you know, a country by country basis and so as we think about targeting messaging, as, as we were speaking about the importance of targeting messaging, um, depending on where individuals are along a continuum of acceptance and hesitancy, there's, there's more work that needs to be done to better understand that. But I think tools like this are really are able to help us understand, you know, in a broader sense, what that conversation is online. Rupali, do you want to respond on that as well? I think you got it, Caitlin. I think it's good. I think it's good. Maybe I can cover very quickly. I think there's a question here um, that's asked. I, I believe, sorry, and I can ask Andrew this question. I believe this recording will be shared. Someone is asking if the slides will be shared, and I think that might go to our, our to Andrew to answer. Hi. Yes, uh, the recording and slides will be posted online. Okay. Great, so we answered that question. Okay, the next question that we have is, did your research uncover whether it is more effective to target anti-vaccine rhetoric broadly or to focus on those who are hesitant of a specific vaccine, but otherwise accepting of vaccines? So I think there's several of you on here that study vaccine hesitancy. You all know that this is a continuum and it's important for us to try to really target the population that is willing to be nudged, if you will, right? That aren't like staunchly anti-vaccine. I think one thing that we did learn about this is that first of all, because of what's happening on social media and because there's been this increasing widening, I would say, of polarization, that it's really challenging and it's very important for us to continue to work across all of these different segments of the population. So that could be what you are saying. Targeting anti-vaccine rhetoric broadly, I think my argument to me, and again, Caitlin, it'd be interesting to hear your take on this. For my work that I have done outside of the sort of social media space, what we have found, it's really important for us to target those that are open for persuasion, right? We know that a very small proportion of the population is truly from a fundamental and philosophical perspective, anti-vaccine. We know that most people just might not have the information that they need to make a decision or might be uncertain about that information. And so to me, those are the individuals that I would target. Um, and that's what we have found to be more effective than really focusing on that small population that might be more 
anti-vaccine. I don't know, Caitlin, if you want to add. Yeah, I think that's right, Rupali. Um, you know, I think we see that you can expend a lot of time and resources trying to change the opinions or behaviors of people who are firmly cemented, you know, in one camp um, with limited success. It's the folks who are more in, in the middle um, who, who have questions that are unanswered, as Rupali is saying, or or who need more information. They just don't have the information they need to make a decision, where you really have the potential to have the most impact and, and the greatest influence. Maybe, um, so looking at another question here, I see one about how you provide positive social media interventions when, when you're hearing reports of serious side effects. And, and I'll just say, um, perhaps not to comment directly on, on those side effect conversations, I think, one thing that we are learning is that it's important to focus on, it's often important to focus on positive message attributes and that, um, I, I don't know if folks are likely familiar with the work of First Draft, often speaking about um, not repeating myths, not repeating misinformation when we're responding to it, that focusing on um, on factual information, focusing on correct information is really the, the right way to go. Um, that said, you know, it's, as we were talking about the importance of tailoring messaging, depending on where folks are along that vaccine hesitancy or acceptance continuum, there may be a need to tailor information in, in a different way. Um, we also spoke about message attributes and the value of message attributes. And so I, I know that one of our studies um, looked at the effectiveness of messaging and and said that, that messages can be more effective when you frame in terms of the benefit of a vaccine. So talking about an HPV vaccine as a cervical cancer vaccine um, and, and thinking about those different messaging attributes. Rupali, do you wanna add more there? No, I think that is, is perfect. I think maybe we can go to this next question. Um, there was an article in the JHU Hub um, oops, I think it just moved for me. There it is about the negative role of Facebook in spreading misinformation about vaccines. I can comment on this, and I know Caitlin and, and Sabin has done an amazing job engaging as well. So several of us at Hopkins have been advising a number of social media platforms about misinformation and how to tackle misinformation. I will say, again, this is from my individual perspective and sort of consulting with a number of these social media platforms. I do think that because of what has happened in the last year, um, there has been such an increase in what I would consider more um, concerning misinformation that we've seen compared to years past. I think that most of these social media platforms have been very open, at least in my opinion, to hearing about sort of concerns that those of us that work in public health have and the effect that it can have on public health. You know, we talk about sort of protection from a First Amendment perspective is that people can say whatever they want on social media, but you know, it is a private company. Um, most of these, all of them are private companies and therefore they can really decide how they're going to censor or not include specific information. And so for me, we have been talking to a number of the platforms and advising them on what they can do. And I feel as though they've been very receptive. I don't know, over to you, Caitlin. So the other thing I would add here is, um, I, I think in looking at the systematic review, um, there are lots, there, there is a lot more research done around some platforms than others. And, and that may be in part due to the fact that some platforms have been around longer um, and, and perhaps have more use. But I think in particular, there is quite a lot of research um, analyzing Twitter and tweets. And, and perhaps that's also because of the accessibility of data there. But, you know, I would just would just call again here for more research on other platforms. We probably spoke about TikTok. Um, obviously, WhatsApp, we, we've talked about a few times. Um, and so I think there's just less research that's been conducted on some of those other platforms, too. Um, Rupali, I think this next question is a good one for you about whether there was any research or articles looking at places of worship, um, social media from places of worship. Hmm. Interesting question. We didn't have any that came up here. I will say, and this is a question from, from Donna, um, just as an aside, not related to this work, I have been going to a number of churches and talking about the vaccine. Um, again, 
people that just have questions and want to hear from someone that might study vaccine science. And one thing that I, I have learned, especially looking at places of worship, is this whole piece that I spoke about a little bit earlier, this idea of key influencers. It's very, very critical. Again, I think as public health has been a bit undermined because of the response and how things have changed, public health guidelines have changed. That I think has de decreased trust, unfortunately, in public health institutions, including doctors, right? Including vaccine scientists. And so one thing that we have learned is how do we leverage some of those individuals, and in this case, individuals like past to really equip them with the information that they need so that they can talk to their congregations about here's all the information for you to make an informed decision whether or not to get a vaccine. And so really interesting. I don't remember any from the 63 that we pulled here um, that came, but we, you know, I can go back and check if you're, if you're interested, I can try to search for that. And maybe Rupali, this next question is, is for you as well. Um, discussing the influence of institutional questioning of vaccines on interpersonal pressures and individual uptake of um, a particular vaccine or vaccination in general. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a really it's a really good question. So one thing that we have learned, and there's been less work in this space, there's been a ton of this work that's been done in sort of the HIV AIDS realm, looking at peer and looking at norms, for example, social norms. We are finding more and more, particularly re related to COVID-19 vaccines, because they're new vaccines, is that people are very much looking to what their networks are doing, right? And what their peers are doing. And so I think this idea of sort of questioning of vaccines, you know, one thing I can say to you is there was a review done about five years ago that found that there has been a decrease in trust towards healthcare providers. And this has been a steady decrease for a long time. And part of that has to do with the fact that people want to have more open sort of shared decision-making discussions with their healthcare provider. 20 years ago, you could go to your healthcare provider, they would tell you to do something and you would likely follow that recommendation. Well, that's really changed. And that also, like I said, I think it corresponds very much with this idea there's been a decline in trust towards healthcare providers. And so I think this general questioning of vaccines I don't think it's an issue as long as people are getting correct information, right? If they have a question. And I think the biggest concerns that many of us are seeing in terms of pockets of hesitancy here in the States as we're rolling out the COVID-19 vaccines is that the reasons why people are saying no to the vaccine is usually due to misinformation. And that is my biggest issue um, more than this idea of questioning. I think if people have questions, they should be able to ask them. People should be able to respond to them. They should not be judged for those questions, but we need to make sure, and how do we improve, I would say, with regards to making sure they're getting accurate information and they're not basing their decision off of misinformation. That's a great question. So I think in terms of, of the next one, Caitlin, yeah, okay. Um, in terms of the next one, so regarding the web search trends, this is a great question. What kind of terms can you use to separate people who are looking for information about vaccines generally from those who are looking for alternative you know, perspectives? I think we did quite a bit, and I should go back and dig a little bit when we looked at sentiment analysis and we were looking at searches when people went to Google, typed in a specific search um, and you know, got specific answers. I think that in terms of the terms, I can try to dig for you. I'm just writing down your name, Stephanie, to see if I can find for you what I know that others have been in this space and have been working in this space much longer than I have, but I can try to find this for you and uh, send that to you. And Rupali, while you're, while you're writing that down, I mean, I think we maybe answered this next question about the geographic spread um, of the articles that were included, but just to know that the, the search was to be global, um, but what we found was that most research was concentrated in high income countries. And I think we even saw um, some, quite a few studies coming out of Northern Europe. So, um, but really limited um, research from low and middle income countries. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah, we wish there were more. And again, our hope, again, the reason we also spoke with key informants, we know other studies have been done, they just haven't made it to the peer reviewed literature. Um, and so I think it'll be critical as more folks are working in this space to get this to the peer reviewed literature. And I think part of, I've seen a few comments around this um, in, the, in the chat today, but I think, you know, a goal for us also is to highlight that need so that more of us are paying attention to generating that knowledge in low and middle income country settings. And, and it's our goal that between Sabin and IVAC, we continue to collaborate to address some of those research gaps as well. Yeah. 
I think I'm just gonna, I'm skipping here. I'm just looking at some of these questions. I think there's one, um, it says in the UK, there are concerns around vaccine hesitancy in particular religious or ethnic communities. Could you recommend strategies to address this? This is a great question. And this is something that many of us that work in hesitancy are dealing with now. Um, so for example, here in the United States, as I mentioned, I have been going to, to churches um, and I've gone to about 25 churches that are African Methodist Episcopalian churches. And so this is all individuals that are African Americans and they have a lot of questions. And I would say the number one question I get is, is the vaccine safe for African Americans, right? That's the number one issue. A couple of things that I have learned about this is that one, that there needs to be someone that they're getting information from that's a key influencer that is not a public health person. This has to do with distrust in the healthcare system, as well as what I would call historical medical trauma that many communities of color in, in different areas and different countries, I would say, have experienced. And so what we have found, to go back to my point of how do we really work with influencers that aren't maybe health folks, right? Aren't public health folks, aren't doctors, aren't vaccine scientists, but how do we really work with them to make sure that they are spreading information that's correct and that's accurate? And that has been very critical because at most of these churches, we're hearing this huge hesitation that they don't trust the healthcare system. The second sort of lesson I would say that I have learned from this space so far is that individuals have questions that they just want transparent answers to. And they feel as though that they can't really talk to their doctor about a lot of these questions that they may have because either they'll be ridiculed or they will essentially be dismissed. And so the other piece I think is very straightforward to me, but it's being empathetic that we're living in this very uncertain time that people have had to live within a context of a pandemic for the last year. And so to really be empathetic towards that and to understand that people are gonna have questions and that they're gonna have concerns and being patient with that can actually go a really, really, really long way. So I don't know, Caitlin, if you have anything you wanna add on this one. No. <laughs> yeah. um, in terms of just some of this, are there any learnings about effective ways to combat misinformation on social media? Absolutely. One thing that we have learned, I, I'm sure people are familiar with inoculation and pre-bunking. If you haven't, there are two strategies that we use in communication to essentially inoculate someone from information that is not true. Um, there's this really interesting game, and I'm going to, of course, blank on it. I think it's called Bad News. I'll try to find it and I'll send the link. And I know Caitlin is, is nodding too. I believe it was University of Cambridge with a firm in the Netherlands that came up with this game that essentially equips people and it uses those concepts of pre-bunking pre and inoculation to really mitigate misinformation so that when people see information, they'll identify it first and then they'll reject it. And I'll try to put the link, oh yay, someone is putting in there. Thank you, Rose. Um, really an interesting game that you can try. And I know they've tried this in a couple of different settings, but it would be interesting to see if you know this can be replicated, I think, in, in other contexts as well. I'm seeing a question that was kind of just, just submitted about whether COVID vaccines um, pose a specific set of challenges in this space. And, and I think the answer is yes, but, but. so um, I, the person who asked this question was, was noting about the different characteristics of the vaccines. You know, we're seeing different efficacy levels, um, different administration, um, different number of doses. And, and I think the complexity around messaging for these different vaccines is really challenging. I would just also say, I think it provides an opportunity, um, some opportunity to educate generally about, um, about how vaccines are developed, about how vaccines work that can potentially have ripple effect to vaccine acceptance for, for other vaccines as well. And so we mentioned earlier, you know, there is this feeling of urgency now because there is a window where we can strengthen acceptance of a vaccine as it's being rolled out. Um, but we also think that not just for COVID vaccine impact, but for broader immunization impact, it's important to, um, to, to take these steps now. I think we probably have time for just about one more question. Sorry, we're trying to get through these as quickly as we can. I know there's a lot in here. Um, one thing that I could say, so I think Brianne, to your question, once key influencers are identified, who should do the work to engage and equip them? I think it's the work of public health agencies. It's the work of you know individuals working at health departments. I think it's everyone. And you know that partner slide that I brought up that you know 
Caitlin and I really worked on to think about what are all the different partners that are in this space, right, with regards to social media. Um, one key sort of aspect that you can use here is you can use a peer educator approach, like a peer, it's called a POL, um, public opinion leader approach, or a peer educator approach. Both of those have been tested and validated, especially within the context of HIV and AIDS, have not been applied in the vaccine context. And so just one idea with regards to how you would do this, how you would implement this um, in person. The other thing that I will say here um, very quickly is that um, in terms of, you know, how can we think about how is COVID slightly different? One thing I will say about that in terms of hesitancy is that pre-COVID, people typically had four concerns related to vaccines. It was ingredients, it was the schedule, it was low risk perception, and it was the misperception that vaccines can, can lead to adverse events such as autism. Since then, we have seen an additional amount of concerns that have come on specifically related to COVID. One has been this idea that the process was politicized and therefore it is not safe. Two, it has also been this idea that it's not been transparent. The process has not been transparent. And so I think there has been a shift just to speak to that question. And as a result, as we continue to think about how we can leverage social media for good, how do we also address these concerns in addition to these existing concerns that we've had about hesitancy pre-COVID is gonna be sort of the next, I think, big push. Maybe I'll just pause there. I know it's it's two o'clock and so I'll just say thank you. It's been really great engaging. I'm so appreciative of your questions. I put in my email, I'm sorry, I'm a little, if I'm behind and I don't get back to you immediately, <laughs> I will get back to you if you have questions. Caitlin and I are hopeful that this review will also be published soon. So you can have, there's much more detail also in that. And maybe I'll turn it over, Caitlin, to you. I'll just add my thanks as well. Um, many more questions than we could get to today. Um, our, our contact information was shared. Feel free to reach out. And we also um, really do welcome your input to not just your questions, but your input and feedback on some of the thinking today that this, this research agenda, this framework is meant to be dynamic and to change and evolve as we learn more. So um, welcome any of your input and, and thank you everyone for joining us today.